Many scholars believe that Ezekiel and his message to Israel mirrors a message that's coming to this world and especially to the United States of America. You're, you're starting to see some of the parallels that we had, but uh, very interestingly how God asked him to communicate in several different things. So let's talk just for a few moments here. Uh, some of it's review. Some of it, if, you, if this is the only message you're catching on our YouTube or online, uh, important to know how unique this prophet is. Again, he was uh, called in his own heart to be a priest, and you can't be a priest in the, in the temple until you turn 30. And on his 30th birthday, God called him to be a prophet. So totally switched his whole direction of life. In the midst of all that, five years before he turns 30, he's taken into captivity. That's where Israel is at this point. They're in the 70 years of captivity. They're believing the lies of the other prophets who are false prophets that are saying, we're God's children. God's going to take care of us. God won't let anything happen to the temple. Look what God did for Moses. Look what God did for, you know, uh, David. And, and, and they're believing the lie that they're okay. They're believing the lie as if it's truth. Here's four other things, too. He's communicating through weird acts. If you were here last week, there's actually eight weird acts. This is one of the eight. We gave five last week. Here's the the sixth one that we'll see in chapter five tonight. And uh, number two, God has a right to ask us to act a certain way, even if it's considered strange. God has a right to ask his people to, to do whatever he wants them to do, huh? And so that's important. And, and Ezekiel was obedient to, to, oh my goodness, such a long time doing some strange stuff laying on one side and then on another side and basically a year and a half where he's acting out a message. And so number three, he's living according to a committed set times for these prophecies. We got that secret in chapter four where it said twice that these were set times and that it alluded to that the people would come and they would say, let's see what that crazy prophet's doing today. How, what's he going to be doing? And if you remember in chapter 4, he, he, uh, God tells him to get a brick, in, a clay brick, and to draw the city of Jerusalem, the temple or whatever on it there. And then, and then make kind of like battering rams and put a, a pan in front of it. Like uh, turn your face away from it. Kind of like child's play of game stuff, but it was a message that was coming across because these were people that weren't going to listen. But you're going to see in this, number four, the pictures he created is worth a thousand words. You can forget, as a matter of fact, I, when I was first as a pastor, it would depress me so much. We would have church. I felt like, oh, it was a great service, everything else. We get a lunch. I'd ask a question and it had to deal with the message I just preached and they'd go, what you talking about? Today's message? Oh, oh, um, oh. What was it that you said again? <laughs> that was like, okay. So you could see that sometimes God uses methods where people are gonna remember just a little bit longer. As a matter of fact, in a few times, several times throughout the year, and, and I haven't done 2019 yet this way, but we started 18 and other years with the illustrations. One year, remember, we had the cooking hats and people came in. People go, I'm not sure what you were preaching about, but I remember there was something about ingredients. Oh, okay, yeah, ingredients and people's. So illustrations and visuals stick with people a long time. And God knew that these things needed to stick with this people for 70 years. Okay, so that's really important. And I'm sure uh, each generation said, yeah, that prophet Ezekiel, what a weird guy, all the things he did. So that's kind of the background again, just a little touching of Ezekiel's life. Let's pick his life up here in Ezekiel chapter five. Now, when you're laying on a side, uh, one, one side for 390 days, Hmm. Now, their year was 360, uh, 
trying to think of all the different ones. So I'm trying to compute how long exactly in our time period. 390 and 40. Let's just say it was a good 14 plus months, all right, is what he's doing this acting out. In that time period, no haircut. Now remember one important ingredient, Ezekiel's married. And so no shaving, no haircut for 14 months. How good, anybody want to take the Ezekiel dare, dare for uh, that time period and not shave or cut your hair and see what you, that we can look like? Anybody want to do that? It'd be fun if as we go through the book, we could watch your life. No, I didn't. I just thought it, if we're looking for visuals, I thought maybe one of you just wanted to be a visual for us and say, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, but his wife had to live with that. Now, interestingly, chapter five deals with the subject of his hair. So let's look at the first five verses. Now, whenever you see the word now in the Bible, it means God's changing something. Something was happening to that point. Now, something else is going to happen, all right? And so now, comma, son of man, and again, that's not the title for Jesus. That's the title for son of dust. It's the son of man that we're nothing but dust in us. And he's being reminded that throughout the whole book uh, because of, of the sins of the people. Take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor to shave your head and your beard. Hmm. Then take a set of scales and divide up the hair. When the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Take a third of the hair and strike it with a sword all around the city. And scatter a third to the wind. For I will pursue them with the drawn sword. But take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. Again, take a few of these and throw them in the fire and burn them up. A fire will spread from here to all of Israel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. This is Jerusalem, which I have set in the center of the nations with the countries all around her. Okay, if you thought last week was weird, yeah, this week, that's why you can see when DJ said he's singing about uh, tonight's scriptures, I thought he was going to be singing about hair, and that's in your notes tonight, the hair, they, it represents something, and this is, a, this is a much broader subject, as a matter of fact, believe it or not, there's 75 different scriptures out there, if you wanted to go down a trail of finding out the all the many different things that happen with hair. You could spend a long time doing it. I picked three for you tonight. I thought 75 might be a little overkill uh, for you. And the three actually go with the subject of what God is asking to do with the, the hair here, right? So hair first is a sign of consecration and set apart by God the Nazarites weren't allowed to cut their hair. Now, that's really interesting. A, a young man that was a Nazarite means set apart. And trivia question, who's the most famous Nazarite? Samson couldn't cut his hair. All right. Delilah got, gave him a haircut and life was over. All right. So it's a sign of consecration, meaning set apart for God. So the hair plays a symbolic role for a religious part within Judaism, all right? So that's important. It doesn't play a role in, in our society today. Uh, I, you know, uh, if you're a teenager in the 70s like I was, you had, how many had hair down their shoulder, guys? In the, any of those? Uh, I would love to see that picture, Nelson, no? Uh, well, yeah, back there, Jason just had his, he had his Delilah moment with, I, I don't know, Crystal probably got hold of him one night. And if you hadn't noticed, Jason no longer has those long locks anymore. He's uh, just like normal Joe back there. <laughs> Did you feel less strength, Jason? And, and can we have this conversation? And will you uh, 
you get to edit this so you could choose whether or not you want to put it in and leave it in. All right. So the second thing that hair represents is a sign of mourning. Two, two really interesting things to, to read uh, to understand this more is Job chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, take time to read it. If you're looking for devotional things, you'll see uh, the mourning process and how it talks about his hair. And also in Isaiah uh, chapter 7, verse 20. And again, it was the shaving of the head as a mourning process and a shame process. Oh, look what's happened to me. So I shaved my head. Okay. So keep that in mind. That's part of what we're seeing here with Ezekiel. The third is, is what uh, comes across not only here in Ezekiel, but also in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 37. It's a sign of catastrophe. And God is really, now don't get this wrong, God is actually playing off of Jeremiah as the older prophet. He's the old prophet in this time period. He's could basically, some believe, been the mentors to Daniel and to others where they would listen to him. He's the old guy and he tells about hair being a sign of a catastrophe and now God's going to use the symbol of again speaking to a people that don't listen. I'm going to speak through the prophet's hair now in this, in this segment of time. Wow, what an interesting thing. Um, if you caught someone probably like Paul caught this right away, one-third, one-third, one-third rings any bells of any other books where there's a one-third catastrophe, a one-third catastrophe, a one-third catastrophe. Revelation, you won the trivia there. There it is. So yes, this is mirrored in what's really as you think Hebrew patterns, Ezekiel many times goes forward with what is taking place, literally taking place for Jerusalem and Israel right at that time. And it draws from the past, as you'll see tonight, we draw from Deuteronomy. You could even draw from Exodus. And it is real for the day that they're living in and it applies for the future. That's the power of the scripture. How many things can you say, it was written for that day, but it, it drew from something back here and it means learn this for out here. Wow, I love that about the Bible. All right, here we go, verses uh, six through nine. Yet in her wickedness, she has rebelled against my laws. Who's he talking about? He's really centered on the leadership there, Jerusalem. He, that's what he mentioned there in verse five, and that it's the center of all the world, Jerusalem is, but yet in her wickedness, she has rebelled against my laws and decrees more than the nations in the countries around her, around Jerusalem. She has rejected my laws and has not followed my decrees. Therefore, choices have consequences. You could, you sh if, you, if you got space on your page, write that down. Therefore, their choices have these consequences. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you and have not followed my decrees or kept my laws. You have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. In other words, they're the bad example even for the nations. Pretty scary. Verse 8. Therefore, oh, when God gets to a second, therefore, you're really in trouble. Uh, and we'll explain that in just a moment. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself am against you. Ooh, they're not just getting consequences from life and, you know, you do certain things in the law of the land. I am against you, Jerusalem, and I will inflict punishment on you in the sight of the nations. One more verse. Are you seeing possible parallel when scholars are saying this parallels our modern day and especially the United States of America? Is, are we the center of the world? Is God actually saying you have, you've been worse. <laughs> hey, let's go past some of the Supreme Court's passing things that, that made the world say, oh, same-sex marriage is good in America. It's good everywhere, isn't it? See what I'm saying? So if he did this with Jerusalem and with Israel, what are the chances he will do this with America? All right. 
Verse nine, because of all of your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have never done before and will never do again. Now, that's an interesting, the last part of that, and will never do again. So, here's what's really scary about this. It's a bad consequence. Remember, they're believing in a lie. God wouldn't do bad things to us. It's the Babylonians. They're fighting us. They're taking us into captivity. And God's saying to Ezekiel, tell them, I'm the one that puts you in captivity. This is your consequences for what you've done to show the nations how uh, a rebel and disrespectful you are. I'm doing this. And it's going to be bad. But it will never be done to this degree again. Now, if you read that correctly, you go, oh, we're safe in the future. Not so. It means it'll be to a worse degree even in the future. When we describe the tribulation, the great tribulation, it says these are days the world has never seen at such a scale they've never realized. You know, because it's always been isolated except for if you go back to Noah's day when the whole world got their consequence. All since Noah's day, it's been isolated choices, consequences, and God's wrath. Okay, so that's important to see that, that when he's, if you're connecting Ezekiel with the future, what he's going to do in the future is going to be, this stuff, what happened to Israel will be considered child's play. And when you see how bad the famine and all the other different things that he brings, well, let's, let's look at this, the three-part judgment. Here's, here's what happens in, in this here. Number one, the hair was divided into three parts as to what was to come. The hair was, was now the story or the message for the people to have a visual. One third was burned, symbolizing pestilence and famine. The reason why we say pestilence is because that's how they dealt with pestilence in those days. They burned them out. They didn't have little roach traps and things that to poison or to spray them or whatever. They burned when, when the pest ones came, they had to burn what they made diseased wise, okay? That was the purifying process back then. So one third was born, burned to symbolize pest ones and famine. One third was chopped, symbolizing many chopped with the sword. Can you imagine this? The prophet after all these years or a year, 14 months laying around, and he's got his hair. I don't know how long his hair could have been. His hair was probably long when he started because that was that day and time. Here he is with a sword going around town, chopping his hair <laughs> different places, leaving it out there. And this was symbolic that many will die from, from battle or within war or within... Uh, it's basically most agreed that it was a symbol of death. Being chopped is not good. Let's just leave it at that. All right. And the one third was scattered by the wind, uh, symbolizing the dispersion of the Jews around the world. So, yes, they're in captivity, and yes, after captivity, they're going to come back, but there's a dispersing. And uh, just as you would see a lot in Isaiah. Remember how Isaiah would deal with uh, this penalty, but it was speaking of something in the future, then something again in the future beyond that? This is actually speaking from 70 A.D. to 1948 is what it's speaking. A long 1800 time period, 1,878 years where there is no Israel. Okay, so here we go. Verses 10 through 15. This is a very, very important part. In the midst of when everybody's evil, everybody's being dumb, everybody's buying into wickedness, you'll find this in every part of society and history, and it's true today. There's a remnant. That's this portion that we're going to read about here in verses 10 through 15. Verse 10. Therefore, wow, third time, so what he's wanting you to know is this is all connected. Don't 
make it as a segment to itself. This is a whole big thought. One third, one third, one third. Um, the, what's going to take place, therefore, can keep the dots connected is what he's saying. In your midst, parents will eat their children. And children will eat their parents. This is not an allegory, folks. I will inflict punishment on you and will scatter all your survivors to the winds. Therefore, fourth one, keeping it connected, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your vile images and detestable practices, I myself will shave you as he asked the prophet to shave himself. God's saying, I'm the one that's going to bring the shame to you. Well, how bad is shame when, you, when you're starving in the famine part of what he's saying? Because remember, it's connected to that. In these famines, remember, the picture when he's laying on his side is a siege against Jerusalem. This is not talking to the Jews in Babylon. This is talking back to Jerusalem. And a siege is going to come. A third wave is going to come. And this is what's literally going to happen. If you remember when we studied the Assyrians, this is what they did. They took captive and sieged the city till there was famine so much that they would eat one another. That's what he's describing here. Oh, okay, where did I leave off? What verse? I myself will shave you. I will not look on you you with pity or spare you he's really set in his jaw isn't he god is uh, that this is this is a long time coming this is not over one incident this is over the whole history of israel and their attitude has been so in stone that they think it's okay to act this way towards god and he's going to show them it's not well, our ancestors did this. We did it because remember the 390 days represented 390 years. He's saying, I'm going to show you. It's wrong to do this towards me. And this is the judgment. All right, verse 12. A third of your people will die of the plague or perish by famine inside you. A third will fall by the sword outside your walls. And a third I will scatter to the winds and pursue with drawn sword. Then my anger will cease and my wrath against them will subside and I will be avenged. And when I have spent my wrath on them, they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal. I will make you a ruin and a reproach among the nations around you. In the sight of all who pass by, you will be a reproach and a taunt, a warning and an object of horror to the nations around you when I inflict punishment on you in anger and in wrath with stinging rebuke. Whew. All right. I, the Lord, have spoken. He takes this again. Now he goes through the the three areas and he gives the one-thirds and what I want to do in this portion here is talk about the remnant part because there's a part that will make it through this and as you see how God deals with them you're going to see now what happened back here in the Babylon captivity and what awaits Israel in the future in 1948 six million Jews died the prophecy of one-third of their population dying they believe is rooted right here in the one-third. That it was for that captivity, but it was also telling of the future event that he, his ceasing didn't cease until after one-third of the population of Jewish people died in World War II by the hands of the Nazis, most of them. Now, how much of a remnant of of this world is even Israel itself. I don't know if you know how many worldwide Jews we had before World War II. The estimate is 18 million. So six million died, they went down to 12 million. It says that it took them to 2015 to get back to 18 million worldwide. The population of Israel today 
in Israel in the actual land is only a little over 8 million. We have almost 8 million here in the United States. We have 48% of all the Jews in the world in the United States. And the difference between Israel and here is scattered still around the world. Isn't that interesting? So point number two. In the future here, Revelation tells us in the Great Tribulation, only one third will survive. So this is speaking about him taking retribution and one third by the sword. That's speaking to captivity, but it's speaking to 1940. Uh, Actually, 1933 is when the Holocaust started, when they started rounding up Jews to 1945, 46, when they finally got freed uh, from all the different ones. that. And they came out, you're going to see when they come out of uh, these concentration camps and death camps and everything, they look like Ezekiel, um, it's a prophecy of can these dry bones live again. In the future, in the tribulation, we saw in World War II, one out of every three Jews die. In the tribulation, two out of every three Jews will die. Only one third will be left. So when people go, you know, hey, you know, if I don't make it in the rapture, I have to stay behind. Whoa. I sit with Paul sometimes. and He'll tell you when one third, one fourth, and, and how much of the world population in itself, not just the Jews, but the world population is going to die. How much blood is going to be through. It is the, it is the worst. That's why in, this, in the sentences before that when it said, and I won't do this again, what he's doing in the future is so much worse as he brings wrath upon a whole world where he's not going to flood them out, but he's going to let the wrath come upon them. Now, Isaiah 11:11. 11, 11, I wanted to uh, share that with you because it's very interesting, and I didn't bring it out when we were in Isaiah, uh, but I wanted to read it to you here. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylon, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. Uh, second time. What Isaiah 11, 11 is doing is actually pointing to the survivors that one third died and he's drawn them back a second time and they become a nation. Um, really interesting when you look at, we're talking time periods of 600, almost 592, uh, Isaiah 721, that far before Jesus is even going to be born. And we're talking about time period in 1948 and in our future. Wow. Um, but all that deals with the Hebrew pattern through it all, this is a remnant, this is a remnant, this is a remnant. I believe that right now, the church, we should never try to cross over how else he deal with the church. He deals with us separately than he does Israel. The Great Tribulation wasn't meant for the church. It was meant for Israel. Just as hell is not meant for human beings. It was built for the angels. Does it mean people that, that claim to be Christian will have to go through the Tribulation? Yes. But it wasn't meant for them. It was meant for Israel. It was meant for God dealing with his bride and to get them to see that his son was the Messiah many people that believe they were church people will go through that time period. Hal Lindsey's doing something, if you, if you haven't watched his program lately, he's reviewing everything that prophetically happened in 2018 that fulfills scripture. He did a part one, he's going to redo it again, I think this weekend, and then part two. Um, I think he's on TBN or uh, Star, one of, the, one of the Christian ones on that. But look in your thing and look for Hal Lindsey. I watched it this last weekend. I was amazed at all. But he made a statement that, that I think he was quoting Chuck Missler in the statement. Him and Chuck used to be friends. As a matter of fact, you guys don't realize how blessed you were that uh, Chuck Missler used to live up here in, uh, and come down from Lake, uh, 
Arrowhead uh, and drive down to Grand Terrace and Hal Lindsey lived in Grand Terrace and every Tuesday night for about eight years they did Bible study together. And then they would record some of their Bible studies and put them out in tapes and stuff and young guys like myself would go, wow, who are these men? What's going on here? You know, and, and he said that he has been watching and seeing the apathy of the church for the day that we live in. And he says, Chuck felt this way and I wonder if it's true. Nine out of 10 Christians are not ready for what God's bringing because they are doing exactly what the Jews did in captivity. Well, God is blessed. God protects America because we bless Israel and, and, and he won't judge us. Well, we've made our land Sodom and Gomorrah. We've killed 70 million kids. If he doesn't judge us, does he have to ask forgiveness to those that he did? So is judgment coming? Absolutely. When, we can't say. Um, but the scary part that these kind of leaders, because I believe these guys have a great pulse on it, that they feel like nine out of 10 Christians aren't ready. Now you know why we really believe it's so important to put this stuff out there on the airwaves because we want as many to hear and to start asking the questions. This finishes up with, with four wrath lessons found in verses 16 and 17. Here we go. When I shoot at you with my deadly and destructive arrows of famine, I will shoot to destroy you. I will bring more and more famine upon you and cut off your supply of food. I will send famine and wild beasts against you and they will leave you childless. Plague and bloodshed will sweep through you and I will bring the sword against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And he does do this through their years of captivities. You see this. But I believe that this speaks, this is where it's reaching back to what he's done in the past, what he did here in captivity. And I believe this portion, he didn't say, I'll never do, do this portion again. He was speaking to a, a portion before that, all right? That it would, he actually could do worse. So here's the... Here's the four things that he just said. Arrows of famine. It's really important that he used that word arrows, that I'm shooting something at you. And Deuteronomy 32 verses 23 through 24 and Revelation 6, 7, and 8. This is the reach in both directions. It's, it speaks to the hail, the rain, mice, locusts, mildew. Um, all that aspect can be involved in that judgment of famine when he uses the word I will shoot this at you like arrows of famine that these things help bring about famine and so what are you seeing in that in Revelation it looks like part of the plagues you go back to Deuteronomy yes that's what you're seeing is a uh, a recap of what happened in Exodus and the plagues and the different things that they did on Egypt and some of the things that God uh, brought to Israel when they were disobedient in the wilderness. So you see those two things. Evil beasts. Now, in my translation here, it actually used um, wild beasts. That's not a good translation for, for that. It's not just a wild beast. It's an evil one. And I really believe that this is speaking to what they will deal in the future when, um, I can't think of the guy's name, Antichius, uh, whatever, when he puts the image in the temple, he is a type or a foreshadow of the true Antichrist. The wild beast, evil beast, and why some translate it as wild there is because who controls the beast? And so Daniel 7, 24 deals with this and Revelation 13 deals with the beast and who's control over him? Nobody. He's a beast. All right. And then he gives this next phrase and he put these two together. Plague and bloodshed. Uh, you don't usually think of plague and bloodshed going together, but they did in here. And this, this spoke back to Deuteronomy 28, 21 and forward to Revelation 16.4. Um, and 16.4 deals with the plagues at the, 
at the very end of the bowls that are being turned. This is three sets, a third. Think of it this way. If you may never have thought this. A third is the, the seals. One third is the trumpets. One third is the bowls. Okay. And in that last third, the plagues in the bowls really mirror a lot of the plagues that are there that are recorded in Exodus and mentioned in Deuteronomy that we're talking about here. So that's the connection both ways. And uh, from the Revelation part of it, the bloodshed ties in really powerful there. The sword, uh, I really believe, points to the future wars here. Um, From this point forward, they're not good fighters. You know, their fighting days were really around David and uh, Solomon, where they ruled in that. Uh, they, they withstand Nebuchadnezzar three times in this captivity here. They're in the second wave. The third wave is where he's going to do what he's been saying. I'm going to take care of Jerusalem. It's, it's been such a stench to me. I'm going to let the siege come. They're going to each, eat each other Parents will eat their kids, and kids will eat their parents. So you want to see who's the strongest in that one, who gets to be the, the eater and, and who's getting eaten uh, in that. But uh, this sword part of it really points to their future. They're not, they're not known as a great war nation anymore. It points to those that will war against them and how God protects them. And I believe it points to What's coming here in the future in this book is the Gog and Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it ties, I believe, with the War of Armageddon out there in Revelation 16, verse 14. And because the, the plague and the bloodshed tied also with Revelation 16, 4, 10 verses later, those, those bowls in the last bowl, Armageddon and the world is turned against them. They're not great fighters, like I say, but they have... God will show that he still shows up on their side like they thought he would in captivity, but they were there because he was punishing them. He will not show up to protect them in the great tribulation until this point, once again. Because something took place a time before that. They finally repent. Something that Mankind has not seen an Israel that's repented towards God that says his son is the Savior. When the Antichrist puts his image in the temple, the veil is removed for Israel for the first time. When Jesus shows up at the war of Armageddon, he's coming back with the church. I don't know if the ladies, if you get to be warriors, us guys, I think we were yielding our swords and we're coming back and fighting with Jesus at that war and we're coming forward to protect the Father's bride that now acknowledges we were wrong, we repent, this is the truth. What a great day.